Hey, Paul, I'm excited to tell you that we are launching a Curbsiders Patreon. Have you heard about this? I I did because I work with you, but tell me more about it. (laughs) All right, Paul. Well, we want to be able to keep offering this great free content, and we're doing things like upgrading our website. We offer transcripts now for episodes, recording new seasons of our miniseries, Teach and Addiction Medicine. The Digest is growing its staff. And Paul, now we're on video. People can see us uh, as we're talking right here. What a treat for our listeners. That's right. So with Cashlack admitting privileges, they're going to get all episodes ad free that's the whole back catalog plus future episodes and twice monthly there's going to be bonus episodes where me and you recap a show and answer some listener questions so people should sign up today at patreon.com slash curbsiders and uh, you get a whole lot of more of Paul America's PCP <laughs> You know, Paul, I I thought about skipping uh, the joke for this diabetes episode, but you know, Paul, I I just can't help myself. You know why? Tell me why. Well, Paul, it's it's a pancreatic disease. <laughs> you got more? Okay, not good. No, uh, no, that was not. I mean, you you can do better than that. You know, Paul. Most people don't know this about me, but I have a pristine collection of candy canes. All right. Yeah, they're all in mint condition. <laughs> and this and is... Paul, in the summers, I used to do road work. And you know what was you know what my favorite candy was back then, Paul? Mm-mm. It was a pavement. <laughs> and are then these, Paul, these puns are mint puns. <laughs> Mints are sweet. At, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Paul, at my grandmother's funeral. Oh my god! There was a. <laughs> There was a bowl of her favorite candy on the table. <laughs> yeah, they were bereavements, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> These are just candy jokes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right, we'll go with the mint jokes. Yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. The Curbsiders Podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. Furthermore, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like more hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we are responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. Welcome back to the Curbsiders. I'm Dr. Matthew Watto, trying to recover from what was surely... <laughs> A legendary, a legendary flurry of puns like no other. Um, Paul, tonight on the show, we're going to be talking about diabetes with a fantastic educator, Dr. Marie McDonald. Paul, uh, how are you doing? And will you tell people <laughs> what is it that we do on the Curbsiders? I, yeah, I'm still recovering. I don't know if, if this goes out in video, you'll actually see tears in my eyes from the series of puns. <laughs> um, but other than that, I'm okay. Thanks. Uh, as a reminder... What do we do? I, we are we are the Internal Medicine Podcast. We use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. Uh, and tonight, what an expert we have. Uh, we have Dr. Marie McDonald, who talked us all the way through her approach to mostly, I think we focus on type 2 diabetes, but how to even recognize that. But I'll let you tell us a little bit more about our fantastic guest. Sure. So Dr. Marie McDonald, MD, she is the director of the Brigham Diabetes Program at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, She is someone who I've known for a long time, as I'll mention a little bit on the show, and uh, came very highly regarded by the great Dr. Rahul Ganatra. She's a fantastic educator of diabetes and clinician, and uh, this episode certainly showcases that. So without further ado, let's get to this conversation with Dr. Marie McDonald. Marie, welcome to the show. We've known each other for a long time, haven't talked to each other for a very long time, not because of any bad blood, just <laughs> we just it hadn't come up. <laughs> so welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us. Thanks so much, Matt and Paul. Yeah, so we uh, we we will tell the audience, uh, when I was a fourth year medical student, I was very lucky to join Dr. McDonald on the consult service uh, at at Boston U and I learned a ton about diabetes. I, I think that's probably led me on this path, Paul, to doing a podcast oh, wow. where we talk a lot about diabetes, this, all of that. So thank you for that. Great. Oh, that's great. I love it. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm right. happy to be here. 
So we're happy to have you here. And Paul is going to give us a case from Cashlack and we'll get right into it. We're going to hear about Ms. J. She is a 39-year-old female with a past medical history noteworthy for hypertension, dyslipidemia, new onset diabetes, and class 3 obesity. Her A1C was 6.4% over the past two years, but has now recently jumped to an A1C of 9.6%. She's symptomatic. She's having some polyuria and just generally doesn't feel great. She admits to enthusiastic participation in holiday food celebrations, and she's not really been reaching her activity goals in the, the colder months of the year this winter time. So some of the guidelines would suggest starting at least one or more medications, considering insulin therapy. I know even, I think in, in my training, I think like once you hit 10, with no evidence behind this to my knowledge, you would that's when you start talking about insulin therapy. But I guess for, for our patient to start, is this someone where we feel like we could maybe make a fair attempt with metformin and lifestyle changes initially before sort of becoming more aggressive? How would you manage this patient sort of out the gate who is presently not on anything? Right. Yeah, Paul, it's a, it's a great it's a great case because there's a couple of red flags um, that we want to just make sure that we hone in on before we make a decision. So one one is that she's young. Uh, she does have class three obesity, and and you know of course we're seeing an increase in even youth onset type two um, related to obesity. So that's not so shocking, but I would want to make sure there's a family history of diabetes just to make sure the the story makes sense because we're, we're seeing even type one diabetes or autoimmune type uh, of diabetes that, that progresses to insulin deficiency pretty rapidly. Uh, we're seeing that in adults more than uh, we used to. So in fact, uh, 50% of what we used to call juvenile diabetes, which is type one is happens in people over the age of 18. So, um, and, and actually I think that that's moving to more like 25 so I would just make sure we're not missing that. And then she also reports that she's um, polyuric and she doesn't feel well. So instead of thinking about that magic number where we start insulin, it's better to just listen to the patient. And, and she's telling you she doesn't feel good. And that's not a good sign. A lot of patients, as you know, they have an A1C of nine and they feel fine. And actually that's the biggest right. problem in diabetes. So she's, she's reaching out to you for help. And I think we have to get to the bottom of her potential insulin deficiency. Um, so what, what I would probably do is be thinking about treating her for sure. And um, you could also, you could always start a therapy, get some blood tests, which I'll, I'd like to talk about, um, and then see her back quickly because I don't think anything that you do today is going to make or break the situation. Um, you, you do have a little time to figure out what the best course is. Uh, what do you think so far? Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, because this this happens a lot because yeah. now nowadays I, almost every patient I'm seeing in internal medicine overweight or obesity is getting an annual A1C. So we have a lot of data on people and you can see where it's been six months or 12 months and all of a sudden they just jump where mm -hmm. like their A1C goes from, you know, pre-diabetes range six to 6.4. And now it's like, you know, like this one, 9.6 or sometimes even the low teens. And the patients are really hesitant to start anything beyond like metformin in those cases. So I, th that's, that's why I, I like this question. So what what sort of investigation are you doing here? I, I wouldn't make a big deal, but I, I would check for antibodies. And it's only because we see the rise in this problem of mm -hmm. autoimmune diabetes. So I would check. It's called GAD65 or glutamic acid decarboxylase 65. It's mm -hmm. just the most prevalent um, islet cell antibody uh, that we see in, in autoimmune diabetes. So I would do that, get it out of the way, make sure we're not missing that, and then um, you, you could also check a C peptide and a glucose level. I would say, um, you know, it, it, it's not, it's not necessary, uh, unless, um, you, you see the patient's not responding to your next step, but I, I would get the antibody. Now, how yeah. would I treat her? I would, uh, want to treat her with something potent because she, as you're saying, she's, um, she's sort of, uh, falling off the cliff, as sometimes we say, this is actually something that is well described. Uh, it's similar to heart failure, actually. You know, we talk about the starling curve. I don't know if you guys remember that. Sure. But, you know, you, you push that 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 uh, failing heart 
with ex- more fluid and salt retention. And then at one point, it's sort of you fall off the curve and the dynamics um, don't allow for compensation anymore. Same thing happens with diabetes in the beta cells. So we see it in type 2 diabetes and in type 1. So this sort of dra- dramatic rise in the A1C, we see it. It's, it's classic type 2. But sometimes in a young person, we just don't want to make, we don't want to miss um, type 1 diabetes hiding under the cloak of type 2. So, so I'm going to say GLP-1 receptor agonist is in this patient's future if she, if she is who she thinks, who we think she is, which is somebody who has type 2 diabetes, probably familial. She had prediabetes for a few years, so it's, it's probably quite classic. And she's going to need something potent because she's she's just quite hyperglycemic. Before we move past, can I ask this sort of seeing the later presentation of type 1 diabetes, is it an increase in prevalence or just an increase in recognition that's happening or some combination of those two things? Oh, it's a great question. I think it is both because we saw in the 90s all of a sudden the prevalence of diabetes ticked up rapidly and that definitely because our definition changed and detection um, changed. There was sort of more process measures all of a sudden coming out from insurance companies to monitor uh, for diabetes with blood glucose, at least at the time. And nowadays, we know we can use A1C. So I think it's both. But now, you know, in the last 10 years, it's really true rise in prevalence rather than um, just increased detection. That's at least what we think. Um, But I, I think it's a combination of both. Let's recap. The red flags from this case would be like if she, because she's young, if she didn't have a family history, you know, that would be a little suspicious. Um, the class three obesity makes it a, a reasonable story. But the fact that she's sick here is what's making you want to be more aggressive about the initial therapy because you you do see a lot of patients who if their A1C tips over a little bit or jumps from six to eight or six to nine and they they're just like, they're not feeling sick. You can start them on metformin. And if their lifestyle is terrible and they really clean up the lifestyle, I've seen a lot of those patients just go right back down to the pre-diabetes range with metformin. Um, but what you're saying in this case, what made you think because she's feeling sick, you might be more aggressive and start more than one agent up front. Like, yeah. To, is that, tell us how the conversation would go here or what, what you would think, what, what mm-hmm. were you thinking for initial therapy here? Yeah, that's great. Um, so, so I would basically explain to her that I'm concerned she doesn't feel well. And, uh, but I do think this is likely progression of what she had before, which was prediabetes. Um, and I would go over quick things that she might be doing that are, that are, that, that are getting in her way. So juice drinking, soda drinking, milk drinking are the big ones. If she's, suddenly going crazy with that stuff, maybe it's a really big factor. Um, but otherwise, you know, if there's nothing really clearly identifiable, oh, for example, let me just add this, a steroid injection into a joint. Um, just make sure we're not missing those things. But if we don't have something super identifiable, yes, I would move her to a GLP-1 and I would explain to her that because her A1C is so high, we want to get her under control. She's young. She's going to benefit from that that really rapid control and weight loss because, you know, the guidelines now sort of say let's focus on weight loss and glucose control at the same time for all patients uh, with obesity and diabetes. Um, and, and then it's, so, it's such a potent agent. It's similar in potency to insulin, and it'll give her so much more in terms of benefits. So I think I would, I would move there quickly. Now I would get those lab tests. And if, if she does have, um, some degree, some concern for insulin deficiency, I would bring her back in and make sure that we do start insulin. But again, that's a small percentage, but don't want to miss it. The other question would be a lot of patients are just unwilling to go from like no medications to giving themselves an injection. And, um, So sometimes I'm like, I'm seeing them, I'm starting metformin, lifestyle changes, and then maybe having them meet with a a pharmacist or bringing them back within a month. And then we're talking about insulin or like a a GLP-1 agonist or something like that. We can see how their finger sticks have done over that time. But uh, it it can be a little tricky to to just get them right on on a 
a weekly injection if uh, if they're if they're not used to taking any medications in my experience uh, so I agree with you that it is hard I'll tell you that it's easier lately because there's so much unfortunate in some ways of the GLP yes. ones you know so it's a little easier to move there early on with patients I would say the guidelines would say that the current guidelines would say that it would be okay to start with a GLP-1 in this patient in the setting of her obesity, but the guidelines would also be supportive of metformin with behavioral lifestyle change. So yeah, I, just to put that out there, I think you can offer either one. My Probably the best thing to say for this patient is to bring her back soon. <laughs> So th this was a question um, at one of our listeners, Anselm Delsa uh, on Twitter had asked about this, like, is metformin still first line or why is metformin still first line for diabetes? That seemed to be something now, now that the newer, the SGLT2 and the GLP-1s are around, uh, we, we did get that question a lot. I, th I think you kind of answered it already. It's like sort of, it's still a right answer to do metformin, especially if the patient's not sick, but in certain cases, if you wanted to be more aggressive, as you said, GLP ones are potency wise as as strong as insulin, so it might be reasonable to start with them. Um, but any anything else to comment on that? Like, right, that that's it. I I think the the other piece we didn't touch on was um, cardiovascular risk, which is with a big emphasis in the guidelines. Anybody presenting with for example, if you did the ASCVD risk score, the AHA 2018 mm -hmm. cardiovascular risk score, if if you do that and somebody's really more than 13 or more than 15 percent um, risk of having an event in the next 10 years, you you, you are you, you should be considering something that can impact that risk. So that's another sort of chip there that might help you um, move to. A GLP-1 in, in the case of where you need potency too. Uh, I would say metformin's never wrong, unless of course it's completely contraindicated. It's, it's never wrong. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. So EGFR under 30, you know, <laughs> exactly. that those people were not starting it, but otherwise yeah. Uh, yeah. we we are we're pretty liberal with the metformin. That's okay. right. And let's so, say this patient is game for anything. So and she whatever you say, Doc, you're the one who's in charge. I just want to get better. What what would have to be different here where you would consider insulin as an initial therapy? Is there a percent threshold that you would go over? Would you have to be really symptomatic? I guess what would change that calculus for you where you'd be offering like same, like you check the labs, it seems like this is type two, where you'd be doing metformin plus an insulin or an insulin plus another therapy is there, or, or ever at this point? All right, Paul, that's a good one. I would say really this one answer, it's weight loss and polyuria. The two of them together. Mm-hmm is insulin deficiency, and we should just treat that. Otherwise, insulin's not the right medicine for type 2 diabetes, unless it is really advanced. So we often can use insulin early on in, if somebody has those symptoms, you can use it to help relieve the insulin deficiency, deficiency which can actually be transient in type 2 right? We see that too. A lot of patients in the hospital, yeah. um, unfortunately getting admitted, we, we try to tr keep them out of the hospital when this happens and give them insulin. And then my favorite thing to do is take insulin away. <laughs> oh yeah. It's great. Yeah. So I, I think the, uh, yeah, on, on the prior episode with, uh, the great Dr. Jeff Colburn, we were talking about, cause you mentioned the C peptide and glucose. So you do a non-fasting glucose and C peptide. You got it. If their C peptide is like low, despite a high glucose, you know, that's suspicious for type one. Um, and the, but, but we talked about that, that catabolic, you know, those catabolic symptoms of weight loss and polyuria that should make you scared. In this case, mm -hmm. we just gave you the polyuria. So not necessarily the weight loss, but it's still, you know, she's not feeling well. Yeah. So she's, she's just making me a little, as a clinician, just want to be more thorough, like all of us. Yeah. And, uh, okay. Yeah. All right. So maybe we can um, 
maybe we can go on a little bit and talk about, uh, cause I, I, I want to make sure we're going to move a little fast and we'll, we can come back to some of these topics, but a one Siegel, she says, okay, my a one C was 6.4. It's now 9.6. What's my goal. And how do you, it's been a while since we've talked about these on the show. I know the, the ACP came out with these somewhat controversial. Most people should be between seven and 8%, which I totally understand where it's coming from, but I think, I think some people maybe maybe misunderstand that. Um, kind of in tune with the way the old opioid guideline, the 2016 opioid guidelines, everyone took it like so literal. Like you, you know, um, I think that's what how people took took it. Like if anyone's below seven percent, I should stop their medicine. <laughs> so how do you think about the um, the A one C targets now, or how do you stratify pay? Uh, yeah, stratify patients. Sure. Yeah. So, so the one thing that's really important with the ACP um, is that they really um, emphasize the Accord study. Uh, you guys might remember this one. This was a randomized sure. trial uh, similar to the UK PDS, which studied people in the early phases of type two diabetes, younger people, the beginning, mm -hmm. randomized them to tight control versus less tight. The Accord were, they were older people and they randomized them to super tight and not so tight. So mm -hmm. less than eight versus less than six and a half. Um, and they found an increased mortality rate. So you might remember that. And it was cardiovascular risk reduction, which is what they were looking for, which they found the opposite. And the ACP guideline was really, really emphasized that study, even though everyone knows with the, with the post hoc analyses that it was just a bizarre outcome. It didn't make a whole lot of sense. It wasn't the, the mortality risk wasn't related to hypoglycemia, which we thought it would be. It was, um, in fact, the people who, these older people who achieved an A1C below six and a half had the lowest mortality. It was the people who were in that tight arm, the tight control arm, who couldn't do it. They were the ones that died. So we're, we're, we don't totally know what the best approach is for the older adult, except that we shouldn't be hammering them down. We should not be, mm -hmm. our individuals who with heart disease especially, we shouldn't be trying to get below seven even aggressively in somebody who's over 65 with a lot of comorbidities. That's where that comes from. The seven to eight, I fully respect that because that's that's where the money is. I always tell my patients the safe zone is actually, if you look at all the data, is below seven and a half, like a safe place. Mm -hmm. You're not going to have rapid progression of your disease, uh, your, your heart, your kidney disease, for example. But the best place to be, if you can do it, is as low as you can. And some people would say normal. Isn't that the best? Mm -hmm. And yeah. the challenge is um, trying is achieving that is not necessarily reasonable from a treatment burden perspective, cost perspective, and we literally don't have any data on people who achieve glucose remission level um, uh, or diabetes remission level glucose and what happens to them in their life. We don't have so any rare. study. <laughs> yeah. In fact, it's like 0.1% or something of people can achieve true remission off medicine. But a good number of people can achieve an A1C well below six and a half on sure. the GLP-1 receptor agonists or lifestyle plus metformin even. A good number of people. And we think that's good. I think that is very good. There's a there's a now sort of a new concept. The diabetes prevention program showed us that the long because they followed people for 15 years. They showed us that the the more time you spend in the normal A1C range, and then they looked at below six actually, the less likely you are to have a complication. That's kind of a sounds like a no brainer, <laughs> but the concept is. Like, in, you know, try to try to spend some more time down in the normal range, even after you get diagnosed with diabetes. Try to get there. If you can get there, spend some time there. That's good for you. So, so her target, our young 39-year-old, is definitely less than seven. We can tell her once she gets to seven and a half or below seven and a half that she's like in the safe zone. But when we want to have her really in a guaranteed uh, long-term disease control space, we want her below seven and even below six and a half. 
Yeah, because I guess, you know, because Accord, we didn't have so many good medications that we have right now, too. It's like the, even the achieving the goals was what, yeah, insulin and sulfonylureas were like throwing these things at patients that we we now know probably don't have like a lot of the effects that we like so much with the GLP ones, and the SGLT twos. And I just, I wonder how that would skew differently if we sort of looked at things today, having the tools that we have to get the A1C where, where we think it needs to be. Totally agree. And that's, that's another hypothesis related to that study that if we didn't have to use so much insulin, um, that perhaps we, we, and, and maybe not necessarily it was the insulin. It was just the not being able to use drugs that were good for the heart. Yeah. And at the same time as potent, then we wouldn't have seen that um, effect. Because it, it's how you get there, right? Like if, if you're getting, so. if you put someone on metformin and lifestyle changes and their A1C normalizes, that's great. You know, that that's going to be a good outcome. But if you're hammering them with like 150 units of insulin a day uh, to get them down, you know, that's, that's a, a much different situation. So I think it's like the tools we're using and the... What's what was crazy about the the newer agents, and we've talked about this before, is that the like the SGLT two studies and the GL, I think the SGLT two studies were the ones right where the A one C wasn't that different between the treatment and mm-hmm. the control groups, and it was a much shorter time, like under five years, and they were able to show benefit versus these other long studies in type two diabetes with the older agents. They really tried to push the A one C way down give them like 10, 20 years and they're still having trouble seeing these outcomes when like with these newer, better tools mm-hmm. in That's three right. years, barely moving the A1C and you can show it. So it just, I think we were in some in some sense focusing too much on the wrong thing. Yeah, you got that right, Matt. It, it's not it's not just about the glucose. That's, we know for sure. Um, and that's why these agents, the, the, the cardiovascular outcome trials, they definitely were designed to not show a difference in glucose control. They mm-hmm. did that on purpose. Um, uh, as much as that could be controlled, uh, just so that wouldn't mm-hmm. be a factor. And it, it clearly wasn't. So, mm-hmm. um, but on the flip side, we know that if you can achieve good glucose control with these agents that don't have, um, that have other benefits, it, it you, you sort of get a, a double, a dual benefit, a dual mm-hmm. effect that we're all trying to achieve now. Um, so yeah, you yeah. got it. So like right now, it seems like Paul and and uh, Marie, if you agree, like with blood pressure, with lipids, with with uh, diabetes, it's like lower is better if you can get there reasonably. You know, if you could get there safely and uh, you know with the right with the right tools, which were sort of every every year we're learning more and more about which which tools and which changes are the best. Um, so, to so summarize the A1C thing, so for your younger patients, um, if you can get them there with reasonable medications, less than six point five, certainly less than seven, maybe even less than six point five. What about the the moderately sick, which is probably our majority of internal medicine patients? Is is that seven to eight window okay there? Someone that already has some cardiovascular or microvascular complications. Yeah, I would say most of the time, uh, and I'll tell you just a couple of anecdotes. Uh, you know, the UK PDS really did show that below seven and a half was a was a better, much better place than above eight. Mm-hmm. Like that, that is really that, so. That's where you know s- some nephrologists would you know back in the day they would harp on the less than seven and a half is really what we need. Like if we could just mm-hmm. get there for most of our patients, um, and I think that's fair. Be, you know, once you're in the seven and a half, you know, around seven and a half, it's really about making sure you choose the right medicines for the other things that we're looking at. We're trying to, you know, make sure the statin is is being adhered to, and an SGLT two would be great, especially if there's there's a, if there's um, kidney disease, and then if heart disease, if you can get on a GLP one. You know, it's not it's less about the A one C at that point, but um, but there are some anecdotes so. We have some patients who are super sensitive for some reason to to glucose exposure over time, and they have neuropathy that is that appears to be progressing progressing aggressively. And once we rule out like B twelve deficiency or alcohol excessive alcohol, it it does seem like we we really should be controlling their glucose better. And mm-hmm. it feels like 
there's data to support that we, if we control their glucose better, they're more likely to stabilize and not progress. That can be so disabling, um, as you know. And then uh, pr probably not so much with the kidney, though. I have to say, it's the SGLT2s are like magic when you you have somebody sitting in the 7.4 range and and you're they're on an SGLT2, their microalbuminuria drops, you know, precipitously. So maybe maybe it's really just about the the neuropathy retinopathy tends to be pretty stable in the seven to seven point five range mm -hmm. so I do like to get below seven and a half but that that's really it's kind of based on the preponderance of data rather mm -hmm. than um rather than what we know is is really ideal for the individual and so I, I do have a handful, and certainly our, our patient, Miss J, that we started with doesn't fit into this, but I have a handful of patients who are older, they have dementia, maybe we have them on metformin just to try to, like, we're really trying to just keep them less than eight or just make it so they're not having complications of hyperglycemia. Um, in those in those cases, um, sometimes I'm, I'm almost forced to, like, use a medicine that I normally wouldn't use, like a baby, baby dose of glipizide or something like that, or, uh, which always feels wrong, but it just, sometimes it just seems to like stabilize people. And cause you have these people that are eight, eight and a half or 9% and you don't want to give them an injection. Um, so I don't know if you have a trick for those kind of cases. <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, and you know, at that point you, you do have to make sure adherence is, well understood by everyone, mm -hmm. the patient and whoever's helping the patient. I can't tell you how many incredibly diligent families tell me that, yes, the pillbox is full and she's doing it right. And then they call me and they say, you would not believe this, but she's been taking X. This actually just happened last week. Like she's been taking glimepiride this whole time. And I had actually stopped it because oh, I God, did I'm switch sure. her to insulin. I did. Uh -huh. I had to. She was polyuric and losing weight. Uh, this happens at the end of the natural history of type two, but I didn't want her on both. And and anyway, you know, the point being is, you know, it, it's hard when people have cognitive impairment. Non-adherence or screwing up the meds is so incredibly common that we just want to make sure we understand that they are taking what we're prescribing. So, so Matt, I do try to use. DPP-4 inhibitors in those patients. Um, mm -hmm. Try might not be the right word. I, I use them. <laughs> I use them because they can sometimes help to move an A1C from nine to in the eight range and that and maybe protect somebody from more aggressive, consistent hyperglycemia. Mm -hmm. They're, they're, they're safe, obviously, in advancing kidney disease. They're very they're not potent as as you know. Right. Um, what I often do when you you have a patient like you're describing and you know the DPP four inhibitor is just not going to do anything, I do use low dose glimepiride. And the patient I just described, case in point, I did try that first because I yeah. knew insulin was going to change her life. It was going to change your family's life. Yeah. Someone has to go over and inject them sometimes totally. if they're not living with family. Yeah. And it I've puts her at risk. Down that road. Yep. So, Paul, I think we have the A1C down, right? So, you know, the younger, healthier people, as low as we can safely get it with some of the newer agents, especially if we know they have other benefits. Uh, the middle age people with some comorbidities, if we can do less than 7.5. And then for the older, sicker people, limited life expectancy, just try to prevent hyperglycemia right. side effects. And, um, I think that's about it. Any, anything else to add there, Marie, before we move on? Oh, I think you got it. You, nice, nice encapsulation. Paul, do you want to get to the next part of our case with, uh, Miss J? So for Miss J, we decided to give it a go with metformin and lifestyle changes. Um, she, she committed to these. We do some counseling. We give her some of our favorite handouts. She comes back for follow-up several months later, and she's not been able to make the changes. Some of them, because life is challenging, it's hard to make these changes. Um, she's gained some weight, and she's also not tolerating the metformin very well. She's having some GI side effects that just are, are not making it worth her while right now. Uh, so we repeat her A1C, and unfortunately, it has crept up to 11%. She's still 
uh, would like to avoid injections if at all possible and would like to try another oral medication. Um, and I, I would love, love to hear your approach to this situation specifically. And we, we've talked, we've kind of alluded to the SGLT2s a couple of times now, but I, I would love to hear if this is some, someone where you might consider starting that as initial therapy or if there's a reason why you might not in this particular patient. Right. Well, I'm going to assume, Paul, that we did evaluate her, you know, her beta cell reserve and all of that stuff. So she doesn't have type one. This is type two. Um, and that's a really high A1C. You know, I, I know before we don't have a threshold above which we restart insulin. And I don't think insulin's the right medicine for her right now. But, um, but she's starting to make you know, me nervous because, you know, we don't really know this, but we think even the first year of glucose, you know, A1C over 10% probably has some impact on your overall health. Um, she's probably having, if you ask her, she most, she very likely has a yeast infection and she's probably really miserable. Um, so I always make sure I do have my, my, my injectables in my pocket so that I can take it out and make it very comfortable and casual. And I, I often show videos uh, to my patients. Sometimes I accidentally put on a video of a child doing an injection. Because <laughs> <laughs> Wait, where can we find, are these from the manufacturer website or YouTube? Yeah, can usually. We share the link? Yeah, sure. It's a TikTok you, video. <laughs> yeah, usually. Well, actually there are some pretty awesome TikTok videos, but I don't go there. I usually use the manufacturer ones. Um, okay. But, uh, but just so they, they understand that it's okay and that they're so fortunate that actually they're in a the situation where they really could do once a week injection, you know, that's actually not too bad. And they're, they're not really in a safe spot. So serious things sometimes call for serious measures. So I, I try to make sure they get that. Um, but, but if really, um, if really she's not going to go there, I would make sure that we have her on extended release metformin because metformin is a potent drug. I doubt she's taking it. If she doesn't feel good on it, she's probably skipping it half the time. Even if she doesn't know she's doing that or remember, she's she's probably doing that. So I would try that and um, make sure she's drinking enough water. Now, the SGLT2 inhibitor is not ideal um, for somebody this hyperglycemic in my, my practice, especially for women, but I'm going to say across the genders, because you do see more side effects related to the glucose, the glycosuria. So you're going to see women will describe more yeast infections to the point where, um, you know, I've seen some pretty serious like perineal tinea. You, you just don't want to mm -hmm. go there. I mean, you can have a patient requiring uh, antifungal treatment for months if yeah. you make the wrong move here. Um, and, and for men and women, you have that, you can have that issue. And then the polyuria is really miserable at this stage with that level of A1C. So I, I do have a policy to get people, you know, below, below nine before I start an SGLT2. That's my little, do I, do I break that rule sometimes? Sure. But the, it's it's because I'm trying to protect my patient from from that side effect that I can predict pretty nicely, and again, make sure you ask her about yeast infection. Do women women suffer in silence with yeast infections their whole life, and they might not connect it to their diabetes. The worst thing to do would be to prescribe an SGLT two if she already <laughs> has a yeast infection. Yeah, it's but you know so so we would get to that. Um, sometimes if we're busy, so. If I consider the SGLT2, I'll describe that to her. And then that usually will make her say, oh, you know, I already have that right now. I have that going on. Um, so what would, I, what would I do? Honestly, I would really just encourage her to do a GLP-1. There is an oral GLP-1, as we know. Semaglutide has an oral version. And it's probably the best idea if she can afford it. And then I'm just going to put it out there. If she, if cost is a real issue, her A1C is high enough that I would probably do a sulfonylurea temporarily in combination with metformin extended release to get some, to get some progress here. You know, she, we got to get her A1C down. And I like the temporary sulfonylurea, even in a patient with obesity who cannot access the GLP-1. Um, mm -hmm. And, and it's too high for the SGLT2. It, it works. 
Tell us about the extended release trick. I would love, I, I've heard this approach before, and I'm not sure we've talked about this on the show, but for someone who who has GI intolerance, how how do you make that conversion? Sort of how do you switch them over to an extended release and what what does that yield you? Because I'm not sure that we've discussed this before. Yeah, great. It, it's, um, you know, most of our automatic titration programs that some of us have set up in different practices here with pharmacists, we, they actually always start with extended release. They don't even bother with the regular stuff because of the GI intolerance. The price is the same. Now, as long as you don't try to prescribe Glumetza, which is a brand name of metformin, which is completely unaffordable. So it's the metformin ER uh, is usually, or XR, and it only comes in 500 milligram tablets. So patients don't like that because they like their 1000 milligram, mm. but it's a smaller tablet. So some people are fine with it. They can take two and two if they're on the maximum dose of 2000. The dosing's the same. So your max dose will be 2,000 a day, max effective dose. You can officially take, you know, 2550 of metformin. That's what the package insert says. But that doesn't, you don't get much more after 2,000 milligrams. So they can take all four pills at the same time. They could. Instead of having to take two in the morning, two at night. They can do that. What In my experience, it, the effect isn't truly 24 hours. So I actually mm. do split it up and do okay. this <laughs> two and two, um, even though that doesn't sound like it makes sense. But for yeah. adherence, I mean, you got to remember, guys, like 50% of the prescriptions we fill are not being taken in a year. Yeah. That the patients fill. So and I just want to be clear, I just because I feel like this comes up a lot in clinic. So it's, you're not really, you're not changing the dose at all. You're just mitigating the side effects by, That's so right. it's still one gram twice a day. It's just a you different formulation. It. Okay. That's right. And can I just ask, because I, I've tried to look this up before, like, does it work better? Is it, how, how good is the evidence that the, that that formulation is tolerated better? Because I, I know, you know, I know that's the hope with it. It's a good question. I, the only studies are with this Glumetza drug. Because uh, okay. remember, metformin is um, is so old, nobody's going to actually study it. And even the ER is generic. Um, right. But Glumetza, that, that's, it's a different micro, um, I forget, micronized formulation. So it's unique. Okay. And they did, they did definitely prove in a randomized trial that it's better tolerated. It's not the same as the extended release the, metformin, but in my practice, it makes a difference, I would say 60 to 70% of the time. And then there's a oh, group, great. Who, you know, a good chunk who just, if they don't do feel well on a center release, you just have to say goodbye to metformin most of the time. This is the kind of expert opinion people come to the show for. This is, I mean, this is why you're <laughs> really delivering. And I, okay. The other question, and do you do the other trick I've seen is actually having the patient when you're sort of up titrating the, the the dose for tolerability you actually start at nighttime. Is that something else that you recommend? So yeah, I so do. like starting at 500 at nighttime, then maybe increasing it at nighttime, and then mm -hmm. once they sort of build a tolerance, then actually start doing it during the daytime. Is that a reasonable thing to try? Yes, totally. And I've seen, you know, my internal medicine colleagues do a much better job than I do at slow titration metformin. Um, I would just say that the extended release kind of allows you to go a little faster. So you don't have right. to do that 250 milligrams at night, which I see sometimes and I get it, believe me. <laughs> but that was when we couldn't get extended release because it wasn't really cheaper, but it's the same. I mean, it wasn't as, as cheap, yeah, but it's actually the, the generics are the they're, they're, they're on the tier one, whatever. Yeah. The, they're the all lower, the cheap. lower tier. Yep, yep. Okay, great. All right. This is awesome. Okay. So, so our patient has an A1C 11 points, 11%. Uh, we, if she's really not going to do an injection, our preference would be a GLP one agonist because of the potency here. But if she's really not willing to do that yet, we can temporarily maybe put her on a sulfonylurea uh, with metformin to try to get that down, make sure she's tolerating metformin. We just talked extensively about the metformin ER or XR maybe as a trick if she hasn't tolerated the, the plain metformin. And then with the SGLT2 would be a bad idea because of yeast infections um, and just and just because her sugar's so high, she's going to not feel well on it. Um, so we wouldn't want to add that just yet. Um Anything else uh, about this that we should talk about? I guess, well, we, we had a question from a listener, uh, this Mike Kelly on Twitter, asking about pancreatitis. Like, what if she said, 
oh yeah, this one time I had a history of pancreatitis um, six years ago, and we're not sure what it was from, if it was, or does it matter if it was from gallstones or alcohol? Um, would that would that make you just say no, no SG or no GLP one? So the answer is no, meaning we wouldn't say no. <laughs> That's mm-hmm. a double negative. It's not an, it's not an absolute. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so it's not it's an absolute not contraindication. Absolute. Um, mm-hmm. What in our practice, in my practice, so gallstone disease disease is very common in um, people as they get older in the, you know, over forties and fifties. And, and so it, it's sort of comorbid almost with diabetes pretty frequently. So most pancreatitis in the patient with diabetes is gallstone or gallstone sludge or whatever you want to call that and triglyceride related hypertriglyceridemia. Uh, and that's about, that's actually probably about a third than the other third is, and I'm sorry, that's probably about half then there's probably 20% alcohol, unfortunately, and the rest are really idiopathic. And it's the idiopathic folks that I guess we worry the most about, but we can get a full history. If we take a history and there's a family history of pancreatitis, that patient might have actually, you know, mutation in the CFTR gene, which is like, if you're heterozygous, this is the CF gene for cystic fibrosis. If you're heterozygous for that, which isn't that uncommon, uh, you won't have CF, but you can have pancreatitis. So oh, interesting. we, we, we want to make sure we don't, we get a family history. Family history is gold, right? If you have it. Mm-hmm. So don't, don't prescribe the GLP-1 in somebody who really has that clear underlying risk. And I would say ongoing alcohol use is on the list, of course. So you wouldn't prescribe. A couple other examples, pancreatic divisum. Um, if somebody has a known, uh, yeah, that's rare, but I have a couple of patients, believe it or not, they referred to me with the question, <laughs> can I give them a GLP-1? And I wouldn't because I, I think that patient really is at risk of, of recurrent pancreatitis. The patient who had the one-time episode and they you know have all the risk factors for gallstone disease, it's probably gallstone sludge. And, um, and so, uh, you know, we would we would prescribe the GLP-1 and probably go slow. The patient who had um, a cholecystectomy, because, you know, after the, the pancreatitis, we would say, let's go full speed ahead. And then lastly, the patient with hypertriglyceridemia, those patients respond really well to GLP-1 therapy. So even if they're, you know, unfortunately, we see the 5,000s sometimes, right? These patients have familial hypertriglyceridemia. They respond to GLP-1. So we should treat them with GLP-1s, not not avoid it for the pancreatitis risk, if that makes sense. I have never heard that before. That's that's good to know. That's good to know. I, I did not know that. <laughs> I didn't know it. I saw it. I, I actually I had a case where I, what I was convinced was pancreatitis from hypertriglyceridemia, and then the A1C came back afterwards and it turns out actually her triglycerides are up because she had uncontrolled diabetes yes and they go that's together. why she felt yeah. so crappy so it was right. it was a fascinating case yeah and you kind of have to you know be be confident but maybe you would go a little slower with the glp1 but i i've never once seen recurrent pancreatitis in a patient with hypertriglyceridemia who i've lowered the triglycerides with the glp1 it's basically you're treating the problem with the glp1 right. mm. Um, and let's not forget, sorry to blab babble on, but the pancreatitis risk is very low. It's very small. Mm-hmm. It's, it hasn't really borne out in the trials, statistically speaking. So, um, it's real, but it's very, the, the risk is small and it's probably those unique people with the risk. So along these lines, cause on a, on a recent episode, we talked about SGLT twos, how really the the, the fungal infection, general fungal infections, which can be quite bothersome, but those are those are the main risk with those. And um, I, I want so on this one, I wanted to focus a little bit on the GLP one agonist, especially now that we're th- considering using these as long term for weight loss. I, I know they've been around for around ten years. Is there any like signal that you're worried about safety wise with patients taking these for? decades going forward. Um, I know like patients with cancer, I think were not really enrolled in the trials, um, at least some of the trials that I looked at. So 
I'm not, mm-hmm. I'm not sure what you think long-term um, safety wise. It's a good, it's a good question. I'm going to say to be fair. I mean, there are a couple of papers showing that actually there's a higher risk of finding thyroid cancer in people mm-hmm. on GLP ones. Right. Um, the problem with those studies and, the most recent one was published in Diabetes Care about a year mm-hmm. ago now. I think it was actually not quite a year. The problem is that what you find is these are all retrospective. And what you see is that somebody on a GLP-1 is more likely to have a thyroid ultrasound. Mm-hmm. And we also know that thyroid, ul- so it's a detection bias. The thyroid ultrasounds will reveal a a micropapillary cancer or something very small and benign and almost benign, nearly benign, um, it's some percentage of time, maybe 10%, 10 to 15% of the time. And, and patients, uh, don't, that doesn't impact their survival, you know? So actually at our recent conference, uh, we talked about this is, this would be hard. I don't think I would ever counsel a patient this way, but you could literally say to the patient, do you want, to take the risk of dying of a heart attack or do you want to take the risk of having a thyroidectomy someday? Cause that's basically all that's going to happen to you when you have thyroid cancer. Um, it's a, it's very unlikely for you to develop a, an advanced form of thyroid cancer in general. And we don't see, we have never seen that in GLP one, um, trials. So that sounds a little somber, but it's it's kind of true. So it looks like maybe we see more thyroid cancer, but it's probably detection because your patients are more likely to say, well, can I just get an ultrasound and make sure? So that's number one. Number two, pancreatic cancer, you're more worried about, I'm sure, Matt. Um, mm-hmm. And the, we don't see an increased risk of pancreatic cancer, even if there's a family history. So there's no reason to withhold GLP-1 therapy in people with a family history or any concerns around pancreatic cancer. We wouldn't, we don't prescribe it often. We, if somebody has a history of like a neuroendocrine tumor mm-hmm. in their pancreas, which is rare, but we see that here at Brigham. <laughs> um, we try to avoid, you know, getting in the mix there and certainly um, a personal history of pancreatic cancer. I think you're just asking for little trouble there because I think that's those, you know, why would you want to increase the concern around survival there? And then the, as far as the benefits, you've mentioned the benefits a couple of times. It it seems like it's mostly a class effect. Uh, I guess the older, the first one out was exenatide, right? I don't know that we've seen the same benefits, but the newer, the dilaglutide, the liraglutide and uh, semaglutide, I'm not sure. Those seem to have these cardiovascular benefits. And uh, is that do, is that how you think of them? Or if, sure, if yep. people are thinking of going to these agents, do you mm-hmm. have go tos? Yeah, for sure. You 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 are so good, Matt. You got it right on there. Um, the early one. I told you, you set me on a good path <laughs> a long time ago. I don't know. Oh, the first, the, yeah, the first ones uh, that were very homolo- homologous to the um, the Gila monster spit. You remember mm-hmm. that story? They, 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 for some reason that, you know, they, they don't, um, have, haven't been shown to have a cardiovascular benefit and they're very different and distinct from the, uh, newer, um, GLP-1 receptor agonists. So liraglutide was the first to be shown to have the cardiovascular benefit. And then we saw semaglutide and, and liraglutide. I mean, and, um, uh, yeah, uh, um, no. Uh, Delaglutide. Like, where am I going? Yeah. There? yeah. They should listen to you, Matt, not me. Um, <laughs> but you're right. So I think that way. And so I definitely, the, the couple caveats, I think the stroke risk reduction in semaglutide studies is very impressive. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I do think of that drug when I think of my patients who've had a TIA or mm-hmm. for other reasons, I think are at higher risk of stroke. That could be just because of the population that they studied, mm-hmm. for sure, because there's not a good reason to think there would be a different effect. But I have to say, it's really impressive. Um, and then for slow titration, because we talked about that a few times, you can only mm-hmm. do that with liraglutide once daily, 
or semaglutide because you can actually manipulate the pen in a much more nuanced way. And, mm-hmm. and of course, terzepatide is the new guy. So mm-hmm. probably worth discussing a little bit. I don't know if you want to. <laughs> that was literally yeah. the next question I had is sort of what your experience been. There was a lot of wild enthusiasm. I think I had to prove for exactly one patient, but where, where are we yeah. headed with that? And how are you, yeah. how are you using that in your arsenal? So I'm just going to tell you, I like it a lot and I'll tell you why I like it. And then I'll tell you, we, we need to see the cardiovascular outcomes to be confident, right? Cause we haven't seen the pivotal trial results, but the reason I like it is because there are six doses and the company has real, realized that if you start low and go slow, you benefit the, the, the patient. And it's very patient-centered. And I, I like that, you know. Um, the thing that we learned about the GIP, G, GLP-1 dual agonism is that um, for reasons that folks are still trying to figure out, it appears that GIP agonism kind of allows the GLP-1 to do its thing with less um, GI side effects. So it's sort of the Mm -hmm. two of them work together, but it's really the GIP allowing the GLP-1 to do its job without hurting the patient, (laughs) if you want to put it that way. So, uh, you know, that's based on actually animal data and it's nice data. So I, I like it and it works and patients and the love loss, it. And the weight loss, we way, talked to this, yeah, yeah it's 20 to 30% yeah. in, in a fair amount of the patients, which is insane. It's insane. Yeah. And diabetes, it's less, which you'll always see. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's complicated, but it's really. Oh, I did not know that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's two reasons, actually. My weight loss um, team tells me it's because when you're in a weight loss study, and that's the whole goal and nobody cares about your A1C, they are, they are drilling, they're giving you so much diet advice. Mm-hmm. And so your patients in those trials are learning how to eat and taking the med. Whereas in the diabetes studies, they're just given the med. And oh, interesting. maybe a little support around diet. So, yeah. so probably you can get 20% if you can really hammer home some uh, reduced calorie diet advice. Let's, let's get back to the case and let's even for a change, give the case a happy ending. So let's say we start Ms. J on a weekly GLP-1 agonist. She tolerates it beautifully. We titrate the, the dose monthly like experts. She <laughs> manages to find time in her life uh, for therapeutic lifestyle changes and they work beautifully. There's a diabetes education program that she attends faithfully. She has wonderful peer support and we get her A1C to, let's, let's say 7.4. Let's put her right in the sweet spot. And she's feeling well and thinks she's the greatest doctor on the planet. So let's, let's end the case there. Um, so thank you for saving our patient, Marie. And I think this is probably the right time to see if you have any take-home points for our listeners. Yeah, sure. That was great. Um, yeah, you know what I would say is, um, you know, insulin deficiency, we started talking about that ironically in the beginning, but it's pretty uncommon in type 2 diabetes. But when you see it and people are really miserable, losing weight and catabolic, recognize it and make sure that we don't miss that. But otherwise... Very high blood glucose is common in type 2 diabetes, and it takes work. And happily, we have potent agents to do that. So that's number one. And, and then I would say the second thing is just make sure you do um, consider what, what you want to, what goals you have for the patient in terms of selecting the next therapeutic. And potency is important, uh, but also the agent to help with weight loss, organ protection, and glucose control. We're trying to do all those three things at the same time. And when we can do that uh, at the same time, choosing the right agent, it, it really pays off. Um, and, you know, I guess the last point is trying to get a lower A1C in a young person, but trying to getting into that safer zone below seven and a half in the patient who's really up there is a good first step. Uh, uh, but trying to get lower for the younger person is is important for a long term. Yeah, and we we're gonna do that. Our our audience are, very sophisticated <laughs> at this point. You know, with your with your training here, they're gonna get everybody. Uh, yeah, through to that goal. So thank you. Awesome, awesome. This has been another episode of the Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy, great. 
Get show notes at thecurbsiders.com. And while you're there, sign up for our mailing list to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. Plus, twice each month, you'll get our Curbsiders Digest, recapping the latest practice-changing articles, guidelines, and news in internal medicine. And we're committed to high value practice changing knowledge. And to do that, we want your feedback. So please subscribe, rate, and review the show. You can follow us on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or you can send us an email to askcurbsiders at gmail.com. A reminder that this and most episodes are available for CME credit through VCU Health at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. And a special thanks to our whole team that helps to make the show. Our technical production is done by Podpaste. Elizabeth Proto and Jen Watto run our social media. Stuart Brigham composed our theme music. And Paul, with all that, until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. And as always, our main Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams, thank you and goodbye. <laughs>